Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. I'm Tony Guerra, the pharmacist and author of the Memorizing Pharmacology book series, bringing you mnemonics, cases, and advice for succeeding in pharmacology. Sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Let's get started with the show. I'm going to go over antihypertensives in a way that hopefully makes a bit of sense. It's actually easier to compare them side by side uh, with a bunch of these, and I'll get into that. But <clears throat> let's start with what the ABCD of hypertension really is. Okay, <clears throat> so it's just talking about the drug classes. So ACEIs, the ARBs, the alpha-1 blockers, the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. Let's start with A. B, C, and D. And there's going to be some oddball ones that I'll talk about at the end, the alpha agonists like clonidine and methyl dopa, the dilators, the peripheral vasodilators, hydralazine, nitroprusside, and then the direct renin inhibitor, aliskirin. But <clears throat> these are going to be the kind of heart and soul of our antihypertensive therapy. And what you'll notice is that stems go really well with these. So when I say stems, I mean the endings. Uh, these, in these cases, they are all suffixes. But for angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, it's pril, as in lisinopril. Angiotensin-2 receptor blockers, it's sartan. The alpha-1 blocker is azacin. Be careful. I've seen zosin a lot. It's azacin. Uh, but again, that'll get you there too, uh, which is a little bit different than tamsulosin. We'll talk about the, the differences in a minute. Uh, beta blockers, again, be careful. First and second generations have the same stem of allol, O-L-O-L, and that third generation will have something that kind of indicates there is an alpha blocking component. Uh, the A-L-O-L with labetalol or the D-I-L-O-L, the DIL for dilation uh, with carvedilol. Uh, calcium channel blockers, we divide them into dihydropyridines, the nifedipine or non-dihydropyridines, which are diltiazem and verapamil. Uh, and then the diuretics. Um, really, furosemide is, is not for hypertension uh, in general. Uh, really, it's hydrochlorothiazide that's first line, uh, and then the potassium sparing diuretics, but hydrochlorothiazide is definitely preferred. Um, so when we talk about uh, you know being able to recognize them, that's kind of the first thing you want to be able to do is make sure that as you look at these endings, you can you know, recognize all these. But what we'll do is we'll kind of cut it down so that it makes it a little bit easier. I know this seems a little bit busy, uh, but soon enough you'll be able to, to get all of these. Okay. All right, well, let's just look at what first line is. First line are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, the lisinopril and the ARBs, the losartan. Um, calcium channel blockers uh, like nifedipine, diltiazem, verapamil, uh, though calcium channel blockers are first line in African Americans because of the poor outcomes with ACEIs. Uh, and then diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide is certainly first line. So let's take a look at the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. Some people call it renin uh, or the RAS system. Uh, the big thing is recognizing what this, what happens here in this pathway. And we'll put three of the drugs in here. So lisinopril, that works here at ACE, where angiotensin 1 cannot become angiotensin 2 if you block this enzyme. Why does that matter? Well, angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor, and uh, it also acts to release aldosterone, which would normally hold on to salt and water. So if you block angiotensin II, you vasodilate instead of vasoconstrict, and you don't stimulate the release of aldosterone, so you're not holding on to salt and water, okay? increasing blood pressure. So the ultimate thing that happens is that you decrease blood pressure. Okay? And this happens with lisinopril by blocking this enzyme here, or with losartan, which is an angiotensin II receptor blocker, actually blocking the enzyme itself, okay, or the receptors on the enzyme. And then aliskirin, that blocks renin directly right at the beginning, 
Uh, but for whatever reason, the, the outcomes were not what we wanted. Uh, so this is definitely not a first line drug. But uh, the first thing is recognize the medications by their stems, recognize they have different mechanisms of action within the RAS system, and then we'll combine them to look at them side by side. So what I do is I take the one that has something more and put it on the left, and I have something that has something less and put it on the right. So with the ACEs and ARBs, when we go through our eye match mnemonic, uh, we see that we have similar indications, hypertension, congestive heart failure, um, MI. But when we get to the adverse effects, we see that really the taste, uh, some you know, irritation of the throat, the cough, that's really angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, not really so much angiotensin II receptor blockers. So when you get there, you're like, okay, well, let me cross that one off on the right. And so I'm just remembering one set of things and then one difference. And we'll see that this happens over and over again with our ABCD. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, that's the one that causes that taste, the throat, the cough. And it's sure, it causes angioedema, it causes hyperkalemia. But we switch to an ARB because it doesn't have that issue with taste, the irritation of the throat, the cough, and those things. So understanding how those work side by side is critical. Okay. Uh, when you look at contraindications, what you would think if you have other potassium sparing medications like spironolactone, diuretic or pregnancy, certainly a contraindication as well, that's out. And then really it's just letting the patient know, hey, you know, if you get this dry cough, don't try to treat it. Let us know. We can give you something that, that won't cause that. And then maybe talking about the foods and other things that might add to the hyperkalemia. Alpha blockers we talked about before, and we'll just kind of go through the three parts of it, where in the beginning we talked about the stem, the azacin stem of prazacin, doxazacin, terazacin, all very similar. And we used the prazacin mnemonic using the word prazacin to remind ourselves of the three indications. That prazacin, the PR for prostate or BPH, the RAZ to remind us it's for Raynaud's uh, which is when your fingers uh, are you know, really cold or your toes are really cold because just not enough blood getting to them. And then hypertension, and we looked at the last SIN for that. And it does this by relaxing the bladder neck for prostate and by causing vasodilation uh, for Raynaud's and hypertension. But the adverse effects come from that vasodilation. So I have a picture here of somebody who's kind of a um, little bit shaky uh, that's getting that uh, maybe first dose effect where first time they took it, they didn't realize they're supposed to take it right before bed so they don't fall down, uh, really feel that reflex tachycardia or orthostatic hypotension or first dose syncope or first dose phenomenon. But again, the big mechanism of action here is that vasodilation. Okay, And then you put them side by side and you see that prazosin is actually second line for uh, hypertension because of that adverse effect that they might just drop. Uh, so we don't want to give something like that. So BPH, Raynaud's, hypertension, those are certainly indications. But when you look over on the other side and take something like tamsulosin or alfuzosin that are really only for BPH, it's first line for that condition because it's really not going to cause that kind of uh, first dose syncope phenomenon, hypertension, all that stuff to the same extent. So what we do is we take the mechanism and we say, okay, we're going to have the same, you know, alpha one bladder, smooth muscle and vasodilation of blood vessels. And maybe we darken out that vasodilation of blood vessels to make clear that we're, we're really being a lot more selective. Okay. Uh, in both cases, the elderly is a concern, coronary artery disease, certainly. Uh, and then we want our patients to be slow to get from sitting to standing. Okay. Uh, beta blocker stems. Uh, we talked about how, uh, the first generation affects beta 1, beta 2. Again, you have the one heart, so it affects the heart and reduces heart rate, but also it affects the lungs. It may cause some degree of bronchoconstriction. And so propranolol is a concern with the asthmatic. But with the second generation, it was beta 1 specific. And we have our BAM mnemonic, uh, where bisoprolol, atenolol, metoprolol, these are three of those drugs that are in the second generation. And then third generation was our carvedilol and our labetalol, 
which are also non-selective, but not in the same way as propranolol, because they also have alpha-1 activity. So that allows for vasodilation, okay? Because what the body's gonna do is, as soon as it sees the heart rate's going down, it's gonna try to vasoconstrict because it wants to get that heart rate back or that blood pressure back up. And so the alpha-1 blocking takes care of that by causing vasodilation. Again, the dill or dial is in that uh, stem. So when you compare them side by side, first versus second, you see you know, very similar in terms of what they do, hypertension, migraine, angina, atrial fibrillation. Again, beta blockers are an antiarrhythmic. Okay? Uh, but again, the mechanism is that we block beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. So our adverse effect with beta-1 would be bradycardia. Our adverse effect with beta-2 would be bronchoconstriction. Okay? And so we take that bronchoconstriction 1 and beta-2 away when we get to the second generation. Now, again, we can cause bradycardia, heart block, have or bradycardia, heart block are certainly contraindications, but also asthma with first generation, not so with second generation. And then they all really do mask those signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, so we want to be careful with our diabetics. We get to the calcium channel blockers, the C in our ABCD mnemonic here. Uh, we really need to separate the dihydropyridines from the non-dihydropyridines. So the non-dihydropyridines affect both vasodilation and the heart. So diltiazem, which is cardizem, and verapamil, which is kalin, versus dihydropyridine, which is dilation only. So uh, the dipine, the dilation only, the nifed dipine, or procardia XL, uh, all these Ds, uh, try to use that to remember that this is just affecting the artery. It is not affecting the heart as an antiarrhythmic. Okay? And so when you put them side by side, you would put the non-dihydropyridines here. And you, what you want to do is show that, okay, hypertension, angina, they're both good for that. But these two are good for atrial fib because it does affect the heart. Nifedipine is not. They both block calcium channels in the smooth muscle, but diltiazem of rapamil are going to have decreased contractility and heart rate. Both will cause hypotension, peripheral edema, and constipation, but here bradycardia is the issue, and here reflex tachycardia is the issue. So again, that vasodilation, the body's not happy with that, uh, and it's going to cause the heart sometimes to increase the heart rate, which may seem counterintuitive. Uh, again, watching out for the elderly and grapefruit juice can be an issue with both of these. Okay, we talked about diuretics going from left to right to you know, figure out what goes where. But with hypertension, we're going to take some of them away. We're going to take the PCT ones away because those are for emergency conditions. And then we're going to kind of focus on first the thiazides, which are first line, and then talk a little bit about loop and potassium sparing, which are second line. Okay, so first line, you just cross everything else off. Uh, really, the distal convoluted tubule with the thiazides, especially hydrochlorothiazide, that's our uh, really first line for hypertension. And we'll probably combine this with triamterine uh, as the form of diazide so that we have the hypo and hyperkalemia kind of balancing itself out. But that's first line. Then we sure can take a look at maybe the, you know, potassium sparing diuretics, spironolactone, uh, amyloride, triamterine, and plerinone. Um, but uh, really those and the loop diuretics, uh, furosemide, torsemide, bumetanide, uh, these are definitely not first line for hypertension. Okay. All right, so hydrochlorothiazide again, um, not only for hypertension, but also edema. It blocks that sodium and water resorption in the distal convoluted tubule. We're worried about hyper bokalemia with hydrochlorothiazide uh, and also that hyperuricemia if gout is an issue. Uh, watching again for that sulfa allergy uh, and then just making sure that the electrolytes, the labs are all on the up and up for the patient. Okay. Uh, and then generally we might pair uh, certain diuretics with other potassium sparing diuretics to make sure that we don't have that hypo or hyperkalemic effect. Uh, but note that when you do block aldosterone, especially with spironolactone, you do have that issue with gynecomastia. 
Um, certainly, if you're going to have that, maybe you're going to have uh, decreased libido. Um, those types of things come along with giving something like spironolactone when you're going to block that um, aldosterone hormone. Okay? But again, uh, we're talking about diuretics. Um, really, that hydrochlorothiazide is going to be our preferred medication. Uh, there are some oddballs, and, and usually it's just here's the thing or two to remember about each one. Uh, the alpha agonist clonidine, we talked about how that um, really suppresses that norepinephrine outflow, so you get that reduction in blood pressure, uh, but that can be terribly sedating and causes tremendous fatigue. Uh, methyl dopa, one of the ones that we can consider with pregnancy in certain situations. Uh, the peripheral vasodilators, so hydralazine again, uh, maybe for an emergency or with pregnancy. Uh, and then nitroprusside is another dilator, but uh, really strange toxicity to have that cyanide toxicity going along with it. And then the renin inhibitor, aliskirin, uh, that's the one where we're really worried about <clears throat> where we're in the RAS system, and it's the area where the ACE inhibitors are and the angiotensin II receptor blockers. This aliskirin works at the very beginning and just blocking renin altogether. But we've just found that, that that's really just not the way to go uh, in practice. Again, this is just informational purposes only. Uh, if you've got a medical condition, consult a medical professional. Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can find episodes, cheat sheets, and more at memorizingpharm.com. Again, you can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Thanks again for listening.